Bible prophecy and the Iranian bomb. In my last video, I explained the parable of the wheat and the tares found in Matthew 13. By doing this, I hope to warn and inform both Christians and non-Christians to the coming judgment. There is no doubt that we are seeing a rise in evil in the world. And a few would disagree with this observation. But what many do not understand is why. Why is God allowing this to happen? In this video, I'm going to tie together several verses of scripture and paint the picture of something else that is unfolding before our very eyes. I'm going to show you where the Iranian bomb and ISIS fits into scripture. Something big, as I said in my last video, is coming in the years 2015 and 2017. They appear to have a prophetic bullseye painted on them. Many signs are taking place in the heavens above and the earth beneath, and I and others have documented many heavenly and earthly events. But the time is running out for the world. Unbelievers, God deniers, Bible bashers will soon be in a very bad place. They wanted a world without God, without Christians, without truth, and without light. Well, they are going to get it. At first, they will just notice the diminished physical light in the world after the six sealed judgments fall. But what God wants them to see is the darkness of their own heart. I'm convinced that the political game in Washington and around the world has been rigged. No matter what we do to reverse the trend politically, it will not work because it is time for all things that have been written to be fulfilled. It is time to realize and accept the inevitable truth of what we are seeing. The end of days is upon us. It is in fact that it is a fact that most people do not have a comprehensive and coherent understanding of Bible prophecy. So for them, they are already living in darkness and they do not know it. For that is the nature of deception. The last week of the 70th week of prophecy of Daniel uh, 9 is about to recommence with a focus on the deliverance of Israel. In the beginning of this prophecy, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel and revealed a six-point plan. In Daniel 9.24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. The first point to note here is that this prophecy of the 70 weeks is determined upon the Jewish people, the people of Daniel, and the holy city, which is Jerusalem. So specifically, the 70 weeks prophecy has to do with the Jewish people and the holy city of Jerusalem. So the 69 weeks uh, part of that prophecy, which is all but a, a seven year period, took us from 444 BC to 33 AD, March 20th to be exact, to the coming of Messiah when Messiah was cut off. Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, in a Jewish reckoning of calendars using 360 days, times 483 years equals 173,880 days. Using the Gregorian calendar, which has 365.25 days, that comes out to 476 years, or 173,880 days. That's March 30th, uh, 33 AD, when Christ was crucified. First coming, the first coming of Messiah, we see that he, was come, he came to finish the transgressions. Secondly, to make an end of sins and thirdly, to make reconciliation for iniquity. This was all accomplished with the first coming of Jesus Christ, where he paid for, for transgressions with his death on the cross, but resurrected from the dead, and reconciled all those who believe in him from their sins to God. But with the second coming of Jesus Christ, the purpose is to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy, in other words, to fulfill all the prophecies, and then thirdly, to anoint the most holy, to, do, to administer the rewards to those that have served the Lord Jesus Christ, served God over all the millennia. Now we must realize that Israel is a nation again with Jerusalem in their control because God is getting ready to restart the prophetic clock concerning the 70th week of Daniel, which is the final seven years found in the book of Revelation. The times of the Gentile rule is coming to a close and it's time for people to understand the times in which we live. It is a most dangerous time to maintain one's ignorance of scripture. In Isaiah 26, 19, we read a passage that says the following, 
Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Now in Isaiah chapter 26, what we see here is a, a prophecy concerning when the Lord comes out of his place to judge and punish the earth for its iniquity. But before that happens, the Lord comes for his people to hide them in the secret chambers. He will shut the doors until the indignation is passed. This, my friend, is exactly what the pre-trib rapture is. That before the tribulation period comes, God is going to come from, for his people, just as it says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when that's what we call the rapture. For those who are saved, which means you have judged yourself a sinner and indeed in, in need of a savior, because works alone are always insufficient, and you have found your salvation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our faith is in what Jesus has done and not what we are doing. God has promised to deliver us from the coming judgment. Soon there will be another great conflict in the Middle East involving Israel and the nations of the world. The world will be gathered for war according to the prophet Joel in chapter 2. His prophecy is also partially quoted in Acts chapter 2 and is fully fulfilled with the opening of the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 to 17. This is what the blood red moons are pointing to. The opening of the sixth seal is near. In Joel chapter 2 verse 15 we read the following, blow the trumpet. In Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. This, my friends, is what's going to happen in the nation of Israel when it's surrounded. They're going to blow the trumpet, blow the shofar. They're going to sanctify a fast. They're going to call the people together and they're going to pray to God. And God is going to supernaturally deliver Israel from the armies of Gog and Magog. But in this passage, there is a dual meaning to this passage as we look at the text. This passage in Joel describes the coming of the day of the Lord and God's angels coming to devour the land and deliver Israel from its enemies. But notice how in verse 15, as the text returns to the blowing of the shofar, there is a dual meaning in this passage. First, the gathering of Israel is what's, is what, what's given here, uh, but it's at a time of trouble when it's, it has an existential threat. But secondly, I believe it's the gathering of the church, the bride. Those that suck the breast is a clear reference to the Gentiles, the Gentile believers, that have come to God to the faithful remnant of Israel. The bride out of the closet is the church uh, or coming out of her closet and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ going forth from the, from the secret chambers to come to rapture the church. Now notice what the prophet Joel says, that the Lord will answer his people. He'll protect them, he'll deliver them, he'll provide for them and, and specifically remove the approach that the Gentile world currently has, has for the Jews. This will ultimately give way to the building of their temple, but with the Antichrist positioning himself as the one responsible for Israel's deliverance. Now pay special attention to verse number 20, where he says, he will remove the northern army. This is the armies of Gog and Magog being supernaturally destroyed. In Ezekiel chapter 38, in verse number 16, it says the following, and thou shalt come up against my people Israel, as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days. And I'll bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. So one of the purposes for, for God allowing the nations of the world to gather against Israel is so that he can manifest himself and be sanctified and distinguish himself from the other false gods that the world is now worshiping. Verse 19 continues, for in my jealousy, and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, 
Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. This, my friend, is what the prophet Joel was talking about. It is the opening of the six seals, the darkening of the sun and the, and the moon, and a great earthquake. So that the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all men that are upon the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall down, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And in the opening of the sixth seal, every mountain and island will be moved out of its place. And the question is asked at the end of the opening of the sixth seal, who shall be able to stand? And it goes on in verse 21 and says, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all the mountains, saith the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many that are with him an overflowing rain, a great hailstone, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. And this is exactly what's gonna happen uh, with the opening of the sixth seal uh, upon the nations. Well, the word there, Kadesh, which is here translated sanctified and sanctified, uh, Kadesh means to uh, consecrate also or to distinguish. And with this event, God is going to distinguish himself from all the other false gods when he answers specifically the, the prayer of deliverance for Israel. In Ezekiel 39, 6, we read, And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. They shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, because the wrath of the Lamb will be poured out when the sixth seal is opened, at the end of this age, which will set the stage for seven years of tribulation. Now, this next point is important. The world will think that it has survived Armageddon. They will begin to believe that the new world leader is the long-awaited deliverer. Jews will accept him as Messiah, Muslims as Mahdi, and left-behind Christians as Christ. But he is an imposter. It's also important to note that right now, ISIS is endeavoring to bring upon the apocalypse they, in essence, believe that the next battle is Armageddon, but it's not. It's the battle of Gog and Magog. In Joel 3, in verse 1, it says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and part of my land. Friends, this is, this is what has been happening for the last hundred years. Officially in 1948, Israel became a nation again. They are back in the land because God is getting ready to fulfill his word. In verse nine, he goes on to say, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, Make up, uh, wake up thy mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into, into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourself together round about. Tither cause, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Now we don't know specifically where the valley of Jehoshaphat is, but we're going to know after the battle of Gog and Magog, because the passage goes on to also say, put in thy sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down to the presses, it's full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, that's the valley of Jehoshaphat. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Notice that the day of the Lord is near. This is not the day of the Lord, it is near. That's exactly what the sixth seal does. The judgment of the sixth seal, it tells us that the day of the Lord is near. The sixth seal is going to deliver the world to the day of the Lord, the coming tribulation, that's also going to deliver the church to heaven. It goes on to say, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, which is exactly what the sixth seal is. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Lord, the Lord, Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. 
then shall Jerusalem be holy. Now, as we look at the passage in Ezekiel 39, 11, we're going to compare these two passages. And in Ezekiel 39, 11, we see, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of, 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 there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of passengers, and there, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamagog, and the passengers that pass through the land when they see any man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the bearers have buried it in the valley of Hamagog. And also the name of that city shall be Hamanah, this shall they, thus shall they cleanse the land. Now the word, the word there that's in, you can see here that's in the violet colors, multitudes, multitudes, and down here in Hamagog literally is the word which means multitudes. Hama, it means multitudes. And translate, Hama wants the name of the city to be found and to commemorate the defeat of God. Ultimately, Hamana means multitudes. So we see in this passage between Joel chapter, th chapter uh, 3 and in uh, Ezekiel 39, we see that the outcome of the battle is referenced uh, concerning the multitudes that were destroyed. So this, my friend, is what is coming. And if you're not saved, between now and then, you need to understand that you are standing in your own valley of decision. Now is the time to decide before that fateful day comes. For many, it will be too late. If you're not saved, you may be one of the lucky ones to survive that day and have an extended opportunity to surrender your life to Christ, but many will not. They will not because in the world order, in the new world order of things to come, you will not be able to buy or to sell unless you worship the beast or the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a master deceiver, and all the world will wonder after the beast whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He will think to change times and seasons, and the man that the world worship at his feet. America is getting a taste of this type of change in the reign of one Barack Obama, who had at best, maybe unwillingly uh, setting the stage for the Prince of Darkness. So, in the parable of the wheat and the terrors, I said, it's time to choose before the judgment. But my friend, that time is running out. In, in the video on the wheat and the terrors, I explained the two charts that follow to illustrate the growth of evil and its relationship to the coming seven years of tribulation found in the book of Revelation. I would like to review those charts to set the stage once more for understanding the Iranian bomb and where it fits in with the Bible prophecy. So again, here's the chart and overview which shows the relationship of the seals, all right, in the church age, the, and the opening of the sixth seal which will end this age, and the seventh seal which is actually going to start the official judgments in the seven years of tribulation, and there'll be one trumpet judgment for each of the seven years until the final woe of uh, the seven trumpet where the vials are poured out in rapid succession. And is this that the Lord is warning the world, the ultimate judgment, when it will be too late, when all the harvesting is done and the church will be fully in heaven. And, uh, and, and so this is what's coming. But I want to focus in on the seven-year tribulation period. And again, I put a line in the middle which marks the event of the abomination of desolation. Also, it marks the casting out of Satan, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9. I superimpose a pyramid over this to represent uh, the, the, the character of evil. On this side, we're seeing the rise of evil, and I'm going to put on the left side the year 1000 AD, the time of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the beginning of the so-called world order that we're in today. And evil has been on the rise since that point, will continue to rise until it reaches its pinnacle at the middle of the tribulation when Satan is cast out of heaven. And this trend, downward trend of evil, will continue on this side until ultimately the battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, where once again people are going to give a final opportunity to make a choice. So we're in this period now where people, where evil is, is being manifested and people are making their choice. God is gathering and bundling together uh, the tares. But now with this video, I want to talk about where this bomb is going to go off and where, we're going to, where we see this in Scripture. 
because the Iran is on a clear pathway now to get the bomb eventually with this agreement uh, with the Obama administration. So let's take a closer look at this. Now we're going to focus in on this pyramid and what we're going to see here is that the line once again represents the middle of the tribulation and the pinnacle of this pyramid is, which is the middle of the tribulation period Satan is cast out. The 1000 AD represents a time when evil really began to rise in the world and the 1000 year reign of Christ represents the end when Satan will ultimately be defeated and cast in the lake of fire. But for right now, we're headed, we're headed towards the seven years of tribulation. Someday soon, I believe we will cross this line and we're somewhere on this timeline. We're looking for the battle of Gog and Magog to take place, the gathering of that, and the judgment of Gog and Magog with the sixth seal. I believe the rapture can take place at any time between now and the opening of the sixth seal. But we don't know the amount of time that we have in between the battle of Gog and Magog and until the time of the rapture and the start of the tribulation period. In fact, the rapture could take place as part of the opening of the sixth seal, which is also a judgment of the battle of Gog and Magog. So when Christ returns, but until Christ returns, evil is going to continue to, to grow until it reaches its climax the casting out of Satan in Revelation 12 9. But today we're going to talk about the Iranian bomb. Where does the Iranian bomb actually fit into this? It's actually found in the scripture. First of all, we need to understand that the ten horns are crowned and have power with the beast for one hour in the second half of the tribulation. You look at Revelation chapter, chapter 12, we find the seven heads are crowned. In Revelation chapter 13, we find the ten horns are crowned. And so, and the ten horns being crowned in the second half of the tribulation is after the, the Antichrist, the beast, reveals himself. And it's at this point that the ten horns are crowned and receive power with the beast for one hour. Now, I believe those ten horns are the Muslim Caliphate. Under the Mahdi, the beast, they have one mind, they hate Rome, and they will burn her with fire. This is what Revelation chapter 17 uh, tells us. Uh, this will also cause the Western armies to come against the Islamic kings of the East and the beast after this. But Christ will return because otherwise no flesh will be saved. This is the scenario, this is the chronology of events that I see that are going to be taking place in the not too distant future. So I believe ISIS is going to end up as the ten nation confederacy that will have power with the beast for one hour in the second half of the tribulation period. This ten nation confederacy will come into existence after the battle of Gog and Magog which dealt a devastating defeat to the enemies of Israel when God supernaturally destroys the many nation confederacy known as Magog and led by Gog as found in Ezekiel 38 and 39. This confederacy will come together in the first three and one half years of the tribulation. It will begin after the beast, the Antichrist, or as the Muslims will believe the 12th Iman or Mahdi uh, makes a peace covenant after the great judgment of the sixth seal fell on the world and moved every mountain out of its place and delivered the world into a state of perpetual darkness with a darkened sun and blood moons. This darkness was caused by God as he destroyed the armies of Gog and Magog and rained fire in the nations that participated in the coalition against Israel. The great day of God's wrath will have come. This is the second seal that we see in Revelation chapter 6 starting in verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll, when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and great men, and the rich men, of the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? In his latest book, Jesus, Jihad, and Peace, Michael Youssef says the following, Jesus tells us that shortly before his return, the Antichrist will arise during a time of global chaos and confusion when the world is in political, social, financial, and ecological upheaval. 
The terrified people of the world, desperate for a strong leader, will turn to this man and give him control of governments of the world. This, my friend, is exactly what will happen when the sixth seal is opened. But fortunately, unfortunately, uh, too many Christians who follow the outdated teachings of the current pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and pre-wrath model teachings will miss this because they do not understand the true nature and meaning of the seals of Revelation chapter 6. Those who believe that the opening of the first seal is the coming of the Antichrist have blinded themselves and those that follow them to the true significance of the first five seals, which have been opened throughout the church age and just how the sixth seal will end this age and provide the global chaos that Michael Youssef rightly asserts must happen. It is out of the chaos caused by the opening of the sixth seal that allows the Antichrist, the beast, the Mahdi, and the false prophet to rise to power. After all, it was this administration that said they never let a crisis go to waste. With the opening of the sixth seal, the world has been devastated and the dead of the Lord will be throughout the earth. We see this in, a, in Jeremiah chapter 25, starting in verse 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should you be utterly unpunished? In other words, what the Lord is saying, if God has indeed brought a promised judgment upon the city uh, which, is, which is called by his name, how does the world think it's going to escape the judgment that he has also promised to bring to it? He goes on to say, You shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Notice it's all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. This, my friend, is going to be the devastating outcome of the sixth seal. And God will have spoken, and they will know that God is, and God is unpleased. Also at this time, the raptured church will also be missing. Millions of Christians are gone, but they will not be missed except by family members and neighbors left behind. This fits with what Jesus said in Luke 17, 28. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So this is why with this passage I believe that the coming judgment of Gog and Magog, the opening of the sixth seal, may in fact also include the rapture of the church. And the, with the chaos that follows from the opening of the sixth seal, the rapture is not going to be this pristine event that's just going to see Christians gone and leave the world in this pristine uh, condition. The, the world is going to be turned upside down, inside out. It will be a chaste row. The sun will be darkened. The moon will be turned to blood. And the, the kingdoms of the world will all be darkened. With the peace treaty signed and the temple started and the Christian resistance gone, the new world order will finally emerge with all its trappings for those who have been left behind. This, according to Revelation 17, 10, 11, is the seventh kingdom. The sixth kingdom is over. The sixth kingdom was the Roman Empire, the empire that existed in John's day. It was the kingdom of the church age, and it was the kingdom of false religions and filled with wars and rumors of wars. In this stage of the beast kingdom, the first three and a half years, the seven heads are crowned, according to Revelation chapter 12. And they share world power, but it is a strained relationship. These seven heads are the remnants of the Western powers after the opening of the sixth seal, after the battle of Gog and Magog. It is an iron and clay relationship as per Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. 
And there are seven kings, this is Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. The other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That's three and a half years. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. And he is of the seven and goes into perdition. This riddle, the understanding of this is the sixth kingdom was the divided Roman Empire, which broke into pieces and spread pagan lace religion and democracy throughout the world. Now look at the next verse. And the ten horns which thou saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them and he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. And he says unto me, The waters which thou saw where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God had put it into their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, unto the word uh, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. This, my friend, is where I see the Iranian bomb going off. The burning her with fire. This is where it's ultimately going to lead to, and this is why uh, the bomb is going to become a reality. Uh, the Ten Nations, the, the, the Islamic uh, Caliphate, is going to get its, its heart filled, its hatred heart filled with its lust, and it's going to drop its bomb someplace on the Roman Empire. ISIS wants to destroy Rome. According to Gary Stearman, the prophecy of Prophecy Watchers, uh, he, here's what he says in reading a circular letter uh, that, he, that he came across from ISIS. While quoting from a letter circulated by a self-imposed caliph, Abu al-Baghdadi, we note the following. Baghdadi revealed that the Islamic State will not stop its aggression until Rome is conquered by its forces. So figuratively speaking, al-Baghdadi stands up and says, we must have a new caliphate and it will happen when we defeat Rome. He promised that the Islamic State, that it, he promised that the Islamic State, that is ISIS, will not stop until its jihad against Rome is conquered. And here's what he said. By Allah's permission, the U.S. coalition will be defeated, and indeed the Muslims will be victorious. By Allah's promise, they will be victorious, and the march of the Mujahideen will continue until they reach Rome. Sturman continues with the following statement. And this idea of Rome having taken over the Middle East was completely realized in the first few centuries following the arrival of our Lord on planet Earth. That first millennium after his death, burial and resurrection featured Rome, if you will, sweeping all over the world, including the Middle East, and holding sway until the uprising of troops under Mohammed and came a series of wars between the followers of Mohammed and Roman Empire. So that, from that day to this, they look at wars coming from Rome, and they look at a victory as a victory over Rome. They see Rome as having spread all the way through Europe. The Europeans came to the United States. They see North and South America then, Europe then as Rome. So they basically are visualizing a victory over the whole world. Stearman then concludes with the following statement. We know there is going to be a war in the Middle East. The forces of the West labeled as ISIS as Rome. They say we are going up against Rome. We are going to defeat Rome. Rome, well, what would Rome be? Rome would be America, British forces. It will be combined forces of Europe. And so this ancient battle which the leaders of Islam depict as Rome versus Islam and Islam versus Rome, they claim out of this is going to come a new super leader who will lead the world to victory for the Prophet Muhammad. And the Bible says a willful king will rise out of that battle and he will rise uh, to power uh, from the Seleucid dynasty. This he is quoting from Daniel chapter 11 verse 46. The fascinating thing he goes on to say to me is that when you read this circular letter by the Islamic State, the Caliph, the so-called Caliph al-Baghdadi, all he can talk about is defeating Rome. That's his idea. It's a very biblical idea. 
And that, my friend, is exactly what's going to ultimately happen uh, with the fulfillment of Scripture according to Revelation chapter 17. And I believe these ten horns, which is going to be the caliph, is going to get the bomb eventually and use it against some Roman city. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He doesn't understand the dream, but Daniel is called to interpret the dream. The head was of gold, and the, the midsection was of silver, the torso was of brass, the legs were of iron, and the lower portion was of, the feet were of iron and clay, and the ten toes are the section that we're going to focus in at this time. The ten toes are the final phase of the Gentile rule. This is the Islamic Caliphate that is now forming in the Middle East. According to Revelation 17, they have one mind. They have power with the beast who will cut off the heads of infidels for one hour. They make war with the lamb and hate the woman, which is Israel. Now, here's the question we need to ask. Who fits this description? The answer is the radical, bloodthirsty, psychotic Islamic State Muslims. This is where the Iranian bomb is going to be used. It will be used by the Islamic State to wipe out the city that rules over the kings of the earth, the mother of harlots. Now, what city will that be is the question. It happens in the second half of the tribulation is the first part that we need to understand. So the city that may appear to be ruling over the world now may not necessarily be the city at that particular time. Right now, we could say, well, that city which rules over the kings of the earth is New York, which houses the United Nations. Or is it going to be Brussels, where the EU has built its own Tower of Babel and has portrayed the woman riding the beast almost as to mock the word of God? Or will it be Rome, which according to ISIS is at the heart of their hatred, the Vatican itself? Personally, I think it very well may be Brussels or Rome, but either one is part of the Roman Empire. So as much as I believe that a deal with Iran makes no sense at all for the stability of the world at this time, it does, however, fit with the scriptures, what the scriptures say about the end of days prophecy.